Thanks for attending this speech. My name is Alexander Fabianj. Um, my, claim to, my claim to fame is the POCO, Portable Components Open Source Project. And I kind of built this presentation on looking at all the different solutions for dynamic type behavior within the C++ programming language and what we can do to alleviate that problem. It's really about the abstraction, just like everybody, everything else. I was thinking about it last night as I was driving here, I got lost because I was following the GPS and the GPS took me on a closed road, which cost me about two hours of a detour, so I may here very late. But I think, you know, I'm looking at that abstraction as a GPS that I can't live without anymore and I trust it. And then there are people who are worrying about those little details that that device knows everything about where you're going and they're specializing and what we're doing is we're on the one side you know we're more and more specializing on the other side we're more and more using these abstractions and the logical end is you know with this more and more specializing you know you know more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing so that's pretty much you know my take on this it was a pretty rough road but um let's get to this topic here um people when they see dynamic c plus plus think like what what the heck is this about? And of course, it's not about C++ dynamic language. C++ is a statically typed language. It's a strongly typed language with some weaknesses in its type system, which, as we'll see later, can be conveniently utilized and taken advantage of to actually create this dynamic-like behavior. So what this is about, it's uh, about dynamic language like C++ solutions, which we mostly need to interface the diverse data sources and dynamic language environments. And this is mostly interesting in this day and age when we're dealing with various data, external data sources such as databases or XML files or JSONs in the web environment where you have the web pages, you have all kinds of different data types coming at you and you have to convert back and forth. You have to have a high level abstraction that is convenient, that performs well, and that allows you to do what you want to do in a quick, efficient, and simple way. So that's what this is about. We're going to look at the existing solutions. So first we're going to look at the problem, what the problem is. Then we're going to look at the solutions out there. So before we get there, let's kind of enumerate those solutions so we know what we're going to be talking about here. First, we're going to look at good old Boolean, who's been around probably, I don't know, 12, 13 years. Kevin wrote that. It's, it's on the road to be standardized. It's a very simple, very well known. So we're going to look at what's done there. Then we're going to look at the boost variant, which I've learned people get confused quite a bit which one to use, any or variant. So we're going to clarify that too and look at the, some challenges that designers of variant have faced when they were designing the class. Then we're going to look at this newcomer boost type erasure, which there's something really, really good there, but there's also the interface that is pretty rough. A lot of you know, square brackets, and there are some surprising things if you are not careful what you're doing. So we're going to look at that. Then there's this guy here, that the Facebook actually created the Foley library, and there's a dynamic class in there. And uh, Andre Alexandrescu and Jordan can remember his last name, they were leading this effort and they basically created something that would allow them to deal with JSON. That's what they do all day long. And they did as efficient as they could. They utilized, they optimized the GCC to the max. They used all the advanced C++11 uh, features. So we're going to look at that a little bit. And last but not least is POCO Dynamic VAR. That's my work. That's part of the POCO framework. And we're going to use that as an example. We're going to use some of the facilities from POCO also to put into these classes for benchmark tests, such as converting from numbers to strings and back. And then we're going to run all of them. We look at the results when we run all those conversions to, from numbers to strings and back and how they perform and compare them. And at the end of the day, we're going to come up with some conclusion on what the current state of the affairs is and where should we go from here. So, let's go. First and foremost, this is one of my favorite statements by Bjarne, which 
which says that basically we do need good libraries. And we need a lots of good libraries. As Herb said, in the last years, uh, going native, that's the area where C++ is suffering the most. And in some cases, you have lots of libraries, but a lot of different libraries doing the same thing in a different way, and it's causing this di divergent problem, which can be good because we learn, as we'll see today, we learn from it how to do things better, how to do things in a more optimal way. But at the end of the day, you have to come up with a solution that is optimal, make it a standard so that everybody programs against that. And here's another quote that I remember from Robert Priestley. How many people read the Zen and the other motorcycle maintenance? Only one. It's a good book. It's a good book. Um, there are some pros and cons in there, in, in my opinion, but it's about quality, really. It's about what is quality. How do you make, how do you determine what quality is, and how do you make things in a quality way? So he's talking about dynamic and static. Really, in his world, what, what he is talking about is dynamic is something that is new and unknown, where you're kind of still trying to find your way, and static is already established, and you know well. But the quote fit in this context, so I use it. So here's our problem. The problem is that we have these different data types here, the uh, data sources. And there will be databases or just files or some kind of automation or whatever the external data source is. You will face that on a daily basis. There's going to be some data coming out of it. It's going to come in all kinds of different formats, sometimes binary, sometimes going to be ASCII. And then you have to serve your destination with whatever they need. So it's going to be some kind of a web interface or an end user or another service running on a server somewhere. So how do we approach this problem? How do we address it? How do we make it easier? First, we're going to take a look at what concerns do we face when we attack this problem. First is, how do we store the value? Obviously, there's going to be all different types of values. There's going to be strings, numbers, custom user data types, and you got to figure out how you're going to store that. There are several options that can go about doing that. Then we'll want to do some operations on those values. Mostly there are going to be conversions, and mostly you're going to be doing conversions from numbers to strings, but there are also some other conversions that you may want to do, uh, how to go about doing that, and what solutions are out there to help with that. Next is, of course, you want to retrieve that value somehow. How do you detect what's in there? How do you make sure that you retrieve the right thing, you ask for the right thing? How do different solutions approach that problem? Next, there's a runtime performance. Of course, that matters because if you want to too much cycles internally, then you're going to suffer the consequences of it and it won't scale. So you're dealing with the speed. And the other concern is how big is your solution? How much memory do you need to accommodate for all these different types? And what are the ways to go about dealing with that? And last but not least is the code size. How big is the and thing going to be, because sometimes you'll want your code to be small. If you're dealing with an embedded environment or you're constrained with the memory, then of course you don't want that code to go out of control. Last but not least, there's an ease of use, and this one typically conflicts with the others. If you want to make it easy to use, then you will be suffering on the performance side or maybe on the size. So. Let's first look at the dynamic data storage strategies. How do different solutions store data internally? First and obvious is on the heap. You just have your void star, and you do new, and this void star is pointing to something, and then it's up to you to figure out in runtime what that something is. So you will suffer allocation overhead. You have to allocate the memory on the heap. And then later, of course, you have to delete that memory. Then there are solutions on the stack. And you can see these little, little notes here. And basically, what, what, the reason why I put notes, these are uh, common ways of naming these solutions. But they're not really 
completely accurate because when you say that the value is on the stack, you, you typically mean that you have internally inside your class some kind of a storage, and then you place the new there. And if you instantiate that on the stack, that's in the, it's on the stack. But if you instantiate your wrapper on the heap, then it's not on the stack. But we always call it on the stack, so that's why that node is there. Um, and also about the union here, we, these typically use unions and placement new, and then unions typically have like a raw storage where you're gonna placement new your thing, and then the, the other member is the alignment usually that where, that where you deal with different platforms and the alignment of this storage. So the concerns here are the size, and then there's also the alignment concern where you have to worry about in some platforms whether you're aligned, and you have to destruct on your own. If you placement new, then you don't get the benefit of automatic destruction. You're responsible to call the destructor. And then there's a hybrid solutions, also known as small object optimization, where you typically look at, okay, let me see how big this thing is at runtime, and then you make a decision, which was predefined at compile time. Are you going to allocate this internally? We're going to allocate this on the heap. And uh, with that, you will pay the runtime performance penalty because you have to look at this value that you're trying to put in. How big is it? And based on that, the decision will be made. And then, of course, in the case where you're allocating it on the heap, you will pay the memory allocation price as well. So these are the notes on it. Dynamic data operations support. This is a tricky part, um, and mainly how do you how do you duct type this thing? How do you add operations to types like dynamic languages kind of can do those things in in a language like C++? That's that's tricky, and Type Erasure does a pretty good job there. We're going to take a look at that solution. So when it comes to the d dynamic data operation support, first we're going to be dealing with the type conversions, and you want all the time you want to convert from string to number and back and forth, but there are also some custom conversions that you want to do. And these type conversions can be static or dynamic. When I say static, some of these things you can delegate to the compiler. You can basically utilize the conversions that compiler provides you with, like if you are converting from short to int, compiler can take care of that for you. Uh, there is also part that you want to do here at the runtime, if you're doing narrowing conversions, if you really want to be safe, then you probably want to check if that in that you're trying to put into short fits into those 16 bits. And then there are dynamic conversions, which will be take a string, parse it, make a number out of it. Standard language operations, plus minus, equality, non-equality, less than, and all those other things that we have within the language. And then there are customs, so custom operations that you may want to do with your custom types. So let's again review the ingredients we have for this recipe. So we have a placement, new and placement new, we have void star, we have union, we have virtual functions, and templates. So all of these solutions that we're going to look at are combination, these things, and they combine them in different ways and provide you with a solution. So, let's go. Boostanning. Boostanning was introduced, I believe it was 12 or 13 years ago in Boost. It was originally written by Kevin Henney and later it was also, there were some contributions by other people. It's a really simple class. This is what you do where you declare any and then you assign something. It can be anything except for array, can be an array. But you can wrap that char array into a string, so now you're good. And then you can assign it, it has a value semantics. It's well known, we know how it works, it's, people are pretty used to it, and the only downside of any is that it provides half the solution. Because when you want to get that value out of it, then you're facing the same problem that you started with. You have to know what it is. So I love the assignment sign of any. 
I do not like at all the extraction side of any because it doesn't do any good for me. Now, there are some circumstances where it's useful, where basically the sender and the receiver know what they're dealing with, but the middleman doesn't need to know. So you can utilize any in those circumstances. And for example, you can put a bunch of any's in an STL container, and the STL container will happily take them in and hold them without ever worrying about what type is in there. So that's nice. But when you need to retrieve them, then you will face that problem of what's in there. A summary of boost N is a container for values of A type. It does not attempt conversion between types at all. It will not involve, as a matter of fact, it is stricter new than the language itself, because if you put in any, if you put short and you try to get int, it's going to throw on you. So it's not going to allow you to do that. So any type in a single container is a generic solution for the first half of the problem. It's a good solution. I like it. And we use any as a basis for the Polko dynamic var, but it's half, it uh, addresses the half of the problem. The beauty of it is that syntactic sugar, where you get template kind of behavior without having to have those square brackets. It really looks nice from the syntactical standpoint. So this is how that is achieved. Basically, you have class any, and then what is templated is the constructor. So that's how any does the trick of receiving anything, but it doesn't force you to use the square brackets when you're declaring it, which is really nice. So what do things look like under the hood? Here's any pretty much in a nutshell. There's a little bit more code there, but for the most part, that's it. So what we have here is a um, the constructor we already looked at. Then we have a placeholder here, which is a, a, a parent, an abstract parent class for the holder itself. So we can see immediately that we're going to pay two, two things here in terms of performance. And that's going to be the heap allocation with the new. And then we're going to pay the virtual performance and, and for the virtual pointer. But altogether, it, it works pretty well. It's a well-known class. It works pretty well. It's a, it, it's a useful class for what it provides. So here's a use case for any. We can declare a container of any values. And then we can declare, say, a short and the string value. And they can both go to the container, happily live in there. Now, when you try to do like this, you can't do this with any. Then if you try to do this, this will throw because the first member is not a string, it's an integer. Now this will work because you're extracting the second member, which is the string. This will work too because you're extracting the short. But then if you try to extract the integer, it won't go. It will throw you again. In my opinion, that's a pretty significant shortcoming. But uh, any Dynamic on the receiving, but static on the giving end. That's pretty much the story of any. We have a generic container for values of different types. It's a very simple to understand and use. It's useful when sender and receiver or caller and callee know exactly what to expect. But the middleman doesn't care, doesn't need to know. Receives the values dynamically gives them statically, conditionally speaking, not literally. It has the heap allocation overhead. It has the virtual overhead of performance and size. Anybody, everybody good on any? Anybody has any questions?
any, yeah. any. If you if you if you auto a equals any of something, it's going to be any. Auto is just I mean auto is just. Uh, If whatever any cast, whatever any cast, if you any cast to int, then you will end up with int because that's what it returns. Uh, auto really is a, it's a different thing from any. Yeah, auto is just a, 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 a shortcut for big type name. That's what it is pretty much. You get exactly whatever that expression returns, no more, no less. Uh, yes, but it's not pretty. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at it later. Mm -hmm. it, there is, it, there is a, a type, you know, through, through type ID. You can see if you're a type ID, you're trying to say, if, you know, you ask for ask it for a type. There's a type member, and the type member will give you the type ID for the held value, and then you can say, okay, is this type of ID of int? But it can be. You know. If you need to do that, you probably need to use variant. We'll look at it later. Right. Every every any has yeah. There's a the, 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 those uh, placeholder hierarchies inside the class itself. So yeah. Just the every any has it in. in it, it is and type erasure avoids that. It just uses straight <laughs> void and does some other trickery. Uh, but there is, there are some conveniences to it. We're going to take a look at it later. The way we've done with the Poco dynamic var. We utilize that because you can make it extensible through that placeholder so that you can put any user type with all the you know conversions in there so it can be utilized for some good things, but you will pay the price. There's no such thing as free lunch. <laughs> I guess we're learning that over and over again, <laughs> but we always face the same thing. So everybody oh. good? Any more questions on any? The next candidate is the boost variant. Here's what the authors say about the boost variant. It's a safe uh, boost variant. It's a safe, generic, stack-based, discriminated union container offering a simple solution for manipulating an object from a heterogeneous set of types in a uniform manner. What boost variant is? It's it's a union of types. That's what it is. Some people like to compare any and variant to void star and union. And to an extent, you can look at it like that, but don't take it too far. They're not exactly like that, but there is some, some parallel there. The main difference is that with the boost variant, you have to tell it up front what you want it to hold at runtime. If you don't tell it, it can't hold it. So if you want int and string, then you have to declare it as such, and it will hold those types, but only those types and nothing else. The constraint is that the first type must be default constructible. Mm -hmm. So if you don't assign any value mm -hmm. to it at the declaration point, then it will default construct the first type. So the first type has to be default constructible. And it also has this guarantee of being never empty. And that's really a hairy problem discuss a little bit more about it later. This is how you declare boost variant, integer and string. So it will default construct integer. You're going to have something in there. But then you can assign it a string. It will happily take that and it will give you what you want when you try to stream it out. And you can use the boost get to get the string out of there. And you can do all the things that you could do with the string. So on the extraction side, the variant is similar to any because it will put that same constraint on you that you can only get exactly what you put in there. But it gives you some 
additional facilities to alleviate that because you can define visitors that can help with those kinds of things. Whereas any only gives you any cast, which is sort of a very simple facility to get your values out there. Visitors are a little bit more advanced and you can do a little bit more user-friendly things with them. What you have to keep in mind as a program when you're using Boost Variant is what types am I holding inside this object and what type do I actually have in there right now? So there's still some headaches when you start using Boost Variant. There's some headaches that you have to you know, worry about as you're using it. So for example, you can do something like this. You declare a variant of short and string you initiate it with a value of 123, but then if you try to do something like this, it's going to throw on you. This, of course, will compile, it will have a compilation error. This will throw because you're trying to get int, but you put in short, so there's no int in there. Very rigid, again, similar like any, but you can get the short out that you put. Visitors. Visitors are a company uh, to variant, and even the authors, what we've seen on the previous slide, even the authors don't recommend to use variant like that. If you need to do something more complex with the variant, you want to use the visitor to really provide the functionality that you need to do. And that's where in, uh, in regards to discovering what type is in there, visitors are really nice with variant because you can declare, you can define those visitors for the types that you have in there and then do different things that you want to do with them. We're going to see an example of how to create a visitor for conversion between a number and a string. As we go through this presentation, we do that for pretty much every class but any and then we will see there are some results of the benchmarks at the end, what that looks like when we run how do they perform at runtime? So the, the visitor is basically, uh, the variant supports the compile time check visitation. And the way you do that is like this, that you declare this class is a converter visitor. You inherit from the static visitor of int. If you had an int and a string in there, you have two visitors, one for int, one for string. Mm -hmm. And then for integer, you just return the same thing. But if you are trying to convert to a string, then you put a functionality in here to convert to string. This particular class is from Poco, and uh, all the solutions for conversion for this presentation were done with the same class. So that everybody is doing conversion with the same facility, so there is no unfairness there in seeing the results. Behind this, behind the POCO number parser and, and formatter, we put the double conversion, which is also used uh, uh, by Facebook Foley, performs well. It's a pretty good library. What's going to happen at runtime, this visitor will essentially, if you have a string come in here, it's going to turn that string into an integer and give you the integer out. So that's how you would convert from integer string using boost variant. This is what the code looks like. You declare variant of integer and string, you initiate it with a string, and then you can apply a visitor with that converter, and you will get the right thing out of there. So now you will have 123 in here. That's typically how you will go about doing it. The, there is also a way to do this generically. The previous visitor that we s we've seen had overloads. We can also do it generically. Say if we just want to double whatever we have in there, then we do this. So whatever you have, whatever supports plus equal will be doubled. If it's a number, it's going to be double the value. If it's a, if it's a string, it's going to be double the string. I'm not sure how useful that is, but cases it might be it might be a valid approach makes it makes things somewhat simpler 
So that's what it would look like. That's what you would get. You would, you would, you would uh, really have to have one for each type that you're holding in here. Oh, you, you just do it. You just do it. In, you just do it in here. So whatever operand you pass in here, but the thing is that what you what you pass in here. You will have to have a, a visitor because this thing can hold either a string or, or an int. So you will have to have a visitor for each one of those. Are you, you, what you're saying is, why don't you have void in here? Perhaps. Why do you have to have anything like that? Sorry? Why do you have to have anything? You, you could. You could, yeah. You could have if you wanted to have a return type, then you would want to have this. But if you don't, you. This is what the default construction for, for boost variant looks like. Basically, what variant constructor does, it placement allocates in the storage mm -hmm. on the stack, as we discussed before. There is a sort of work, on, work in progress on doing it on the heap, and then there are some also complications with the never empty guarantee. But the default implementation is basically it's a placement new on the in the local storage, and then there's an indicate which which basically tells you what what you currently hold inside the variant. The constructor looks like this, so there's a convert construct with this dummy value here that is not used, so you pass the operand in there and this is a flag that basically tells you whether you're doing this from just a user type or, or base type, or are you doing it from another variant. And then you indicate which, and then you initialize with the storage address and the operand. So there's really two things there. There's that, I think that's on the next slide. That's what the, what the storage looks like. So you have that which, two things, which tells you which type you're holding in there. And then there is a storage itself, which is basically a storage T type. And the storage T type is a union of a buffer, which is the raw memory where you will construct your type that you're holding in there, and then there's an alignment. The address will basically just give you the, the address of your internally held type. The challenge that the designers of Varian faced with the never empty was, I really, w I really wasn't part of the Varian design, and I'm not really an expert on the Varian. I just read through the and I looked at the mailing list and where they faced and talked to some people that were involved there. But it's really about how do you deal with, if you're constructing from another variant, if you're copy constructing from another variant, what if thing throws? How do you get back to the valid state? So there was different ideas thrown there. And variant, actually, the documentation states that it might allocate on the heap in such cases. So there might be in the background, it might allocate on the heap some storage to keep the old value there until it makes sure that the new one was actually constructed without an exception, and then it's going to get rid of the old value. Yes? Yeah, 
Yes, the question is about the alignment. Why is the alignment needed in the struct? In theory, yes. In practice, when you go to different platforms, no. Yeah, go ahead. So well, are you saying that it won't take the size into, into account? I guess that that's, that's even even more accurate, accurate answer that the size is not necessarily taken into account. The alignment will be just for the chart. You will see you will see the alignment in all the in all the solutions that are out there in production. You will see the alignment in the structs like this. They're always there. And it's even been there's a STD align in C plus plus eleven. So it's always it has remained a concern. The boost variant summary strongly typed, kind of similar like any, except that the number of the set of the types that you can hold in there is limited. It's more complex than, than any, but it also provides some more advanced facilities to do various operations on the values <coughs> inside the class. Default, it's on the stack, i.e. internally, but it can also be configured to allocate on the heap. It's a compile time switch, but it doesn't come like that uh, by default. There is no built-in data conversion. You have to provide that mm -hmm. as an external facility. And then there's that implementation complexity due to never empty guarantee. I kind of thought about that, and I'm, I was thinking, why this never empty? But if you don't have never empty, then you always have to worry about empty when you're doing your visitors. So that's kind of a downside of it. Personally, I. I'll kind of go with empty. If we just make it, make it empty, because the the example that we've seen before, where you have say variant of int and string, the default construction of int is meaningless. So you might as well have an empty there. But yes, go ahead. Yes, that that is. That was proposed in different conversations that I've seen on the mailing list, but then you, you do have to worry about that empty when you're doing your visitors because there's one implied type always in there. So if you have in string, then you also have to worry when you're doing visitors, you also have to worry about the empty because the empty is always in there. So that's the downside of it. I don't personally see it as a big problem. I, I would prefer because the complications otherwise are just big. Complex. Yes. R right. That yes. That might be also an idea where it was proposed that you can inherit from static visitor, and that that parent class would always have the empty case. In. That could be one of the solutions. Again, I'm really not a top-notch expert on variant. I didn't design the class. I use it to do the, some benchmark tests. So there's been a lot of conversation about it. There's been some proposals to standardize variant. Some people don't like any. They want the standard variant. Some people don't like variant because it's complicated, because of the never empty guarantee. There's conversations going around. I think both solutions have their ups and downs. There's always a trade-off. The visitors perform reasonably fast, and implementation employs all known means, this is according to the authors, all known means to minimize the size of variant objects, often unsuccessful due to alignment issues and potentially harmful to runtime speeds, so not enabled by default, as we mentioned before. Here's a question that was asked before 
if you find yourself doing something like this, in my opinion, then you should use variant, not any. If you are trying to discover what type you have, and you have many types in there, and you have this kind of logic, then you're probably better off with the variant. Before we go further, any questions on variant? Any comments? Everybody do that? Yeah. One question. Sure. Is the variant a class actually creates the same problems with C++ with the never empty guarantee? I guess the question is, does the variant class have the same problem with the C++ and never empty guarantee? And the answer is yes, is the best I can tell. Now, there, there is somebody who knows quite a bit about variant. Right, yeah, but it's, but it's pretty much the problem still can't. Yeah, the, the problem is still there because you have that, you, want, you, want, you have this and you want to replace it with something else that has to be constructed here and if this throws then you have to be able to go back to something that's good. Well, it does help, yes, but th does it really solve the problem? I don't, I don't think so. Yes. But so as long as you have a node for a and you can detect the fact that you have a node for a move, you're okay. Right. In some cases. But that's that that's true it, that's true with some other yeah. you know, that was true before when you only have a move with some other types that you know you know they don't throw. So you know you have a type that won't throw on construction, then you have to you don't have to worry about it. You need to annotate all the types that don't throw when you uh, yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> Okay, next, boost type erasure. This is a newcomer. On this one, I'm even less the expert, but I did study it a little bit. It's an interesting solution. I like some aspects of it. It's also complex, and it is my opinion that another layer of abstraction on top of it will be really nice, and it will give some, some much needed uh, interface uh, easing in that sense. So. What boost type erasure does, it generalizes boost any and boost function. So with boost any, you can put any value in there, and then the boost function, you can kind of attach operations to it. So if you think of a dynamic language-like behavior, you, you have two aspects there. You have different values that you can hold inside some entity, and then there are different operations that you can do on it. And that's where boost type erasure comes to help you if you're trying to do something like that. Personally, to me, the name is confusing. And it's a really what you think of as a type. To me, type is more associated with the value. And then the operations that you do on the type are not part of the type. But that's a whole other can of worms. But here's a list of the proposed alternatives of the names when the type erasure was uh, discussed for introduction in Boost. Stage typing, deferred typing. Type interface, interface. Static interface, value interface, structural typing, duct typing, and runtime concepts. Ah, I don't know. I'm not sure which one would be <laughs> which one would be the best. Ty type erasure to me is a little bit. I think when I think of ty type erasure, I would think of any. It just erases the type. So once you put thing into any, the type is erased. You can use it without regards to the type. Shuttle it around. The type erasure does more than just type erasure. That's my uh, opinion on it. It addresses the limitations of virtual functions, their intrusiveness, the dynamic memory management, and the limited ability to apply multiple independent concepts to a single object. Those are the, the goals that type erasure is aiming to alleviate. What it looks like is this, you can see there's quite a bit of, uh, uh, compared to any, <laughs> I'm not happy with this syntax. It does the pretty much the same thing. You put anything in there, and then here, basically, you have this vector of concepts. So, so you can put that in and have 
with any value and then you can cast it out just like you would do with any it's very very similar now feel free to interrupt me if, if, if you want I, I see you smiling so if you have any comments don't don't worry about interrupting so how do we do how does type erasure add operations to that any type? Something like this. You add all these things that uh, you're, uh, you want your any to be capable of, so you can make it, you can make sure that it's copy construct, constructible, copy constructible, it's type ID, it's incremental, so you can do plus plus on it, all streamable, you can stream it. And then here's your x and then you can do this so you give it 10 plus plus 6 you get 11 out that's pretty straightforward right but let's say that you want to do something a little bit more complicated and you make it edible don't eat it you just can add so you have this any type and then you declare any type of a double and another any type of an int and then you add them. and here's a million dollar question what does this print anybody knows the answer nobody come on now let me help you let me help you let me help you here whatever you say you can go wrong that makes it a whole lot easier right i mean this is about you know dynamic You would hope that it would, yes. I, I, that, that, was my, that was my take on it. That was my take on it. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's an undefined behavior. So that's I'm coming from when I say we need another, there's, a, I mean, there's another layer that needs to be on top of it, shielding mere mortals from these kind of things. Because, I mean, an innocent C++, average C++ user would do this, you know, this is the first thing you want to do. <laughs> That's the first thing I want you to do. Okay, let me see. <laughs> and there's a way around it. But even the way around it, I'm not happy about this name because it's called relaxed match, where it should be a strict match, really. <laughs> if, you, if you add relaxed match concept, then it will be more strict in you know, allowing you what you can do with it. Now, can you maybe explain why it's called relaxed match? Because I couldn't quite get it. <laughs> Oh, you, you can, I'm sorry, say again. I just, I changed it to really accessibility. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the idea is it becomes, it becomes when you add that it adds extra checking so that you can get away with more, basically. Now, you must be the author of that. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, that's good, you know, because you certainly know more about this thing than I do. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is by no by no means to you know bad. This is a, this is a it's a it's it's a good thing, but it needs a little bit of something to shield people from troubles like this. That makes me nervous. <laughs> so what we can do is basically wrap that properly into placeholders and do the right thing and get what we want out of it. So we declare double and int, and then we put these requirements in here with the, with the placeholders appropriately so you can copy construct them and add them. And then you make a tuple of those. And then you get uh, your types out of it and you add them and it'll do the right thing. So, so my my point is all all this should be kind of somewhere behind a nicer interface. That's the way I'm looking at it. And then also you will have the same problem if you try to do something like this. Go ahead. So I guess I'm missing something here. Where where is it that in here he's probably no. he's probably better <laughs> better source than I am. Okay, so 
what happens is in that type step, you can think of the underscore a to underscore b as the acting white template parameter. Then when you create the tuple, it matches underscore a to the first argument, which is the double, and underscore b to the second argument. How to do the conversion with the type erasure? Provide a similar facility like we did with the variant. What you want to do is something like this. You want to have an integer and then construct any from that integer and then be able to do something like this. Turn that into a string. First, what you do in achieving that goal is basically you declare this two string struct with templated on the from and to type that you want to convert. And then you have this magic apply function in there that takes those from and to and turns from into to and then returns it. The other part of this scaffolding is basically a binding. We have this concept interface, and you put that two string struct in there, and then you rebind that, and you have this two string in here that will do the basically just delegate that conversion to the original one. The way to use that thing is like this. So you say type def any of two string. You call that stringable. You declare an integer. You declare a stringable from that integer, and then you call two string, and you get the right thing. Sorry. So this will actually do the right thing. This will put one, two, three into your string. Any critique in the approach? This one? Yeah. I just wanted to point out that this is a really common mistake in other try graphing steps. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Good, <po> good <laughs> catch. Good catch. Thanks. I must have picked it up from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but good catch. Thanks. It's a really easy thing to do. Obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll fix that on the slides. Thanks. The storage, as you can see here, there's basically just the, just the void pointer, and then the, the type is, it goes directly into, into that void pointer. So, and type erasure performs pretty good I have to say on the on the benchmark it, it did pretty well the the binding of the the concept of the actual type basically through the binding template and then there's an actual storage in data and then there's a table type which essentially the table type basically holds the your Concepts, right? If I remember correctly. It's basically the same as the Right, right. Just static, right? So that's the that's the really contribution of the type eraser that it alleviates that, that those virtual calls that you can get with the virtual uh, hierarchies. The summary. The type erasure extends any invariant or variant by introducing a mechanism for attaching operation to types of compile time. Very, very useful facility. Very, very useful functionality. I like it a lot. It addresses the limitation of virtual functions. It does use heap allocation to store values. It's a pretty complex thing. And if you're, it's really, right now at this point, it's, a, it's pretty much for experts. I'm thinking an average C++ user should get involved with doing 
much with it. Would you agree, or do you think well, that that's yeah. not accurate? And that's exactly what I'm saying. When I say an interface, I'm not saying that you have to come up with a whole library, but perhaps you know the type depths or constructs similar to the two string that you know I showed before, and things like that that people commonly use that will be really safe for an average user to just take and use. Yeah. Right. Right. There are some slippery scenarios. Here's my comment on another layer of abstraction. Everybody good on type erasure? OK. Still have time. So next step is the Facebook Foley dynamic. Now, before we go here, OK, let me see. Pretty much probably everybody here is a Boost user, I would assume. But can I see some raise of hands? Boost users? OK. Does anybody use Poco here? Wow, I had more I had more users than that at ACCU. Now, the, does anybody use Facebook Foley? <laughs> anybody who never heard of Foley? Wow. Okay, so I'm doing some. Anybody never heard of Poco? <laughs> well, no. Before 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 this before this. All right, just to gauge a little bit uh, the audience. Foley dynamic is a runtime dynamic type value for C++. It's similar to the way languages with runtime type systems work. That's, that's from the authors. It, it'll hold types from a predefined set of types, so it won't hold anything. There's a union there with the you know, int double and all those things. It supports objects and arrays because JSON was their motivation. So they have those dynamic object and array types. It's union-based, somewhat reminiscent of Boost variant, sort of similar to it. It has runtime operation checking, so you're pretty safe into what when you do things that your that the engine behind it will check what you're doing. It's Linux only. It is heavily GCC optimized, uses anything they can use from C++ 11, and the build is a nightmare. I, I told Andre it took me four hours to build a dog on thing. It should be better than that, and they acknowledged it. it. It was, there's a lot of little dependencies, and once you build it, it works, but it's, it's just not easy. The way it works, and I only tried on Ubuntu and Fedora. I don't know about other Linux distributions, but I would assume it's similar. We have some packages that make it easier here, but some things you just have to go and grab yourself. What you do with the uh, dynamic is something like this. 12 equals 12. So now it's ha holding an int, and then you can have a string, which is not a standard string. It's a Facebook string which is compatible with standard string, except that you can't assign Facebook string to standard string. There's a support for null pointer, Boolean, and all those good things that you will see in a dynamic sort of language. Once you build it, it's good. I like it. <laughs> I just hate the build process. It has a clean, intuitive, and reasonably predictable interface. I would say it's very user friendly if you're you know, C++ newbie or average user, you won't end up in trouble with fully dynamic. You can do things like that. String of one, two, three, and then you can do bar of string. Then you can get it out as int. You can get it out as double. Then you can assign it an int. Then you can get it out as string, but if you want to assign it to standard string, then you have to go back to C string. You want, this is a Facebook string. So Facebook string, because it's compatible with the standard string, you can, you can do this. 
but you can't directly assign it because standard string doesn't know how to assign a Facebook string. Mm -hmm. So the row uh, cannot perform the numeric conversion? It, it will throw, yes. Uh, it, I believe it will throw. I'll, I'll have to check. I believe it will throw. I'm kind of almost safe. Almost sure. So in this case, it's not. I mean, you declare it STI array, but it's STD string. And you're saying that it's making an underlying storage for the Facebook string, even though you. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you can assign a standard string to a Facebook string. You just can go the other way around because the standard string doesn't have the mm -hmm. constructor for it. Yeah. Well, I'm just. Um, which one exactly you're referring so to? So the, the first line there is STD string, right? Yes. And then you assign it to bar. Yes. But somehow it's producing and making it a Facebook string. Right? Yes, but yes. The reason why they did the Facebook, and I'm not speaking for them, and I didn't really investigate too much, but it has to do with the performance. They've done something with probably, I would think, some sort of, uh, small object optimization or something that makes it perform better. I mean, they have billion users. I'm sure they have good reasons to make it perform. So, and you can do also this. It's a similar thing, like like one here. In behind the scenes, it's somewhat similar to the boost variant. This is what the storage looks like. So it's basically a union of predefined types and here's the the alignment again so we can have in there is the null array boolean double integer and string the way how you get the store type out of the dynamic Basically, for example, if you look at that S string, it will give you the Facebook string. Obviously, as simple that they're using here is, is this template function. So it's going to look into what it is and then, then do the right thing. They try to get no throw. So the answer to the question is you're going to get null, not you won't throw. You're going to get null if you can't do it. Uh, okay, let's take a look at it. And the get no throw here is going to compare the type, and if the type is no good, it's going to return the null pointer. So you're going to get the null if you can convert. It won't throw. It will be a. It will be basically. It will be a dynamic that's holding a null. You try to do the conversion, and if it doesn't go, you're going to get back the dynamic that's holding a null. That's opposite to like what we do in Poco, we throw. If we can't convert, we throw. Can you go one slide back? Sure. Uh, two functions over there. Which one? There's a yeah, we're, we're, we're going to get to that. The, the, those are the two. Those are the functions that are in the two header. Um, I, no, I don't, I don't think I'm going to throw, no. But I, I would I would really have to check. You can return you know, you can return it. Oh, you're asking if you're so are you, were you asking if you're assigning to a dynamic or if you're assigning to a and just a plain old type? I wasn't I wasn't even concerned about assignment, just um, in terms of extracting it, whether how if that gives a bad cast or um, if it's the wrong thing. Yeah, I I will have to take a look for that case. If you are if you are converting to we, uh, I'll have to take a look into in, in the two functions exactly what they do. The two functions they use double conversion, I know that but if, if they if he, he can't do it, he may he may throw there. He may throw. So this is what the get no throw looks like. Uh, it calls the get address, and then the get address calls the get 
data, and the get data basically calls. See, it will give you it will give you the the in it will give you the member that's in there, but that member might not be good if you have something else. So basically, this is where you shield yourself from that, that you don't end up retrieving something that is not good. If you're holding a bool and trying to retrieve an integer. <coughs> the conversion is actually in the two functions, and it was just too big to, to put it here. It was written by Andre. And I'll have to take a look exactly how those functions behave. I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe they're, they do they do throw. In the, Behind the scenes, it's using the VA double conversion. It supports arrays and objects, so you can do things like iteration, and you can do things that it's kind of similar like what you would do with the JSON. Can you explain what VA double conversion is? VA double conversion is, the, is part of the, V8 is the JavaScript engine in, in Chrome, the double conversion is the library that is inside the V8, but it's also available, it's a Google library, it's also available as a separate library for conversion to numeric, to and from numeric types. So it's basically, it's that hairy problem of if you turn, if you convert doubles and you end up in, you know, you have 2.0, but you end up with 1.99999. You can you can look it up. It's freely available. It's a Google uh, open source library on the Google code. We also use it uh, behind the uh, Poco dynamic conversion uh, classes. The summary of the Foley dynamic is that it's built around Facebook's JSON's needs. It uses C++11. It also uses Boost extensively performs very well and in my opinion has a really good design performance balance where you get this nice interface but it also performs well. User friendly interface, it is not portable. And that's probably the biggest downside for that class that it's Linux only. It's holding only predefined types, it's hard to build. Sure. The question was whether dyna Foley Dynamic is Linux specific because of the Linux operating system or the GCC and its support for the C++ 11. I really am not qualified to answer that, to be honest with you, but It, it might. I think what it supports by, by I, I would think that the guys at the Facebook, they do what makes sense for their business. They run their business on Linux with GCC, and that's what they do. That, that would be my take on it. But again, I'm not speaking for that. I'm just presenting on what they've done. I believe I believe uh, the Facebook string is dragged in. Right. So the question was how difficult it is to use as a standalone class, and the answer is that there are some Foley classes that are dragged into the dynamic. I'm not really sure for a fact we know it's Facebook string perhaps Facebook vector how many other things I had to build the whole poly in order to run this so the, 
the license is Apache, I believe. The license is Apache. And from what I'm seeing is Facebook will drive this in the direction where they want it to go. And if there is enough interest to port it to other platforms, they'll probably be happy to see that. But I don't, I don't see a lot of effort from them to make that happen so far. And it's been it's been out for probably a year, I believe, since they open sourced that. So. Next, Poco Dynamic VAR used to be called Dynamic Any. We put in the separate namespace. It's based on Boost Any pretty much. So you, what you will see in there is Boost Any Foundation, and then that extraction side is elaborated on so you can do things like similar to what you've seen with the Foley Dynamic. It aims to be a general purpose dynamic typing facility. It balances between performance and ease of use. It provides transparent conversion. And my beef is just the STD string where I can't assign my uh, var to STD string because depending on not only on the compiler, but on the compiler version, your STD string will be confused whether to take it as a STD string or a char star. And really, then you have to do two, two string, then it's going to do the right thing. Trying to typecast it, I played a lot, and it just, you're safer to do it as string. Everything else is kind of, you can assign things to each other. And we'll see later examples in the code. The conversion is checked, so if you try to convert, say, an integer to a short, and this is bigger than what will fit into a short, it will throw. So it will use. It will use the compiler facility to convert it, but if it's too big at the runtime, it's going to prevent from that from happening. And then it has the capability to hold any type, and it's extensible for user-defined types through holder uh, specialization. So it's basically pretty much the holder that you've seen in any, but it's been elaborated on a little bit so that you can provide your own types and your own conversions for those types. There's an optional small object optimization, but it's still very much a work in progress. It's not coming with the releases by default, so we're not quite there yet. The test that I've done, I have not seen a whole lot of improvement. With more on 32-bit than 64-bit, so I just had to find a little bit more time to work more on it. Here's what it looks like under the hood. You will see immediately that it's re reminiscent of that any class. And what basically you can see is that it does the same thing here. So you have that syntax sugar and you have that holder that's essentially holding any value. And the holder is elaborated on a little bit. So here we have the parent class, and then we have the intermediate sort of for end user extensions, and then all the built-in and most frequent types, such as int, doubles, std string, and some common classes that we have, like date, time, and things, and tuples, we provide the basically the, the uh, holders for those. So you don't have to worry if you're doing things with them, they will be there. But if you have your own type that you want to hold inside the dynamic var, and you want to define, you want to specialize the holder for it, you can do that. It's, it's open for extension. The conversion, this is an example of conversion to smaller unsigned. So it's going to do the checks and see if, if everything's good here. And at compile time and then at the, at the run time it's going to check for the upper limit to make sure that you don't you know, do something that you're not supposed to do and then and only then it will do the thing. Of course there's a price to pay for it. You shield the user from the danger but then you pay the price on the back end. This is uh, what the uh, to and from string uh, conversion looks like so it inherits from the from the var holder and the conversion basically this is specialization for string conversion to short is that same old number parser uses v8 double conversion just like uh, facebook foley and then it will convert to the smaller 
conversion to double, an example here. So if you go from string to double, it'll do number formatter, and it's going to format that into a double. This is to and from number, similar thing, 16-bit integer to 32-bit, check for smaller, 32-bit to unsigned 32-bit to signed 32-bit. Again, it will check for, for conversion. So it does shield the user from all, all the potential perils that they may get involved with. And then there's uh, extract, which will, is basically an equivalent of any cast. Well, you, if you know what's in there, you can just get it out of there and not go through the, all the discovery. So just say, hey, I know what's in there, just extract this type, you'll get that exact type, gain some performance. There are, there are some checks done, of course. It'll check if your types are, if it's really the type that you're trying to get out of there. But this pretty much performs the same as uh, the Anycast. That's what this is. This is what it looks like in practical use. So essentially, you do a string and then assign that string to variant var, var, and then you can assign that to an int. Then you can assign that int to, to var. You can increment it, and you can see the value will change. You can assign it to a double. Then you can add just a, another double, have a float. It'll do the right thing looks and feels like a sort of dynamic language. There is also a dynamic struct similar to Foley object where you can do things like this. Here's what I was talking about before. If you are constructing a string, then you have to explicitly say to string. The other way around you can do, you can assign to string to a var without any kind of conversion, but here you have to say to string. So that's the only kind of thing that I don't like, but it's not that big of a deal. If you want a little bit more performance, you can template your struct on a, a pod. So you have keys here as integers. You can have basically the uh, ve <coughs> vectors of wires and then similar like what you would do with, with any. And then also if you put that the vector inside the var will beca behave like an array. So you will be able to do all the things that you do with an array. A lot of stuff going behind the scenes, you will pay the price if you try to do that. Uh, when you do this, it will, like if you do struct to string, or if you do array to string, it will give you JSON out of it. So that's built in. These are the results, and this was several years ago when I published an article in the ACC Overload and compared some sizes of the binaries that you get. So you can see, for example, the code of any and the code of dynamic any at the time. So there's a quite a bit of size price that you will pay for this functionality. That code is big. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. So that's pretty much the downside of this approach. And then there's also the performance penalty that you will pay for all those conversions in the background. In some cases, it works well. In some other cases where you really need to squeeze every bit of performance out of it, you probably will not opt for that. And that's the same thing that the Foley dynamic people tell you. you know, sometimes it's very useful, but sometimes you just can't resort to that kind of a, a functionality. The benchmarks are pretty much along these lines for all these classes. So essentially, what we did is create a string, then put that string into some holder, then assign that string to an integer, then assign that integer, uh, and then assign the string to a double, then assign integer back to the var, and then assign the var to string, and then double to var, and then again string back, back from, from var into a string. This is pretty much what we've done with uh, boost variant, type erasure, Foley dynamic, and Poco dynamic var. And the results are here. So, type erasure, obviously, the winner here. Foley dynamic, pretty good. And then var and variant was faster than var. Now, one surprising thing when I was doing this, 
I didn't run, I couldn't run dynamic on Windows, but I was really curious about how, because there's a C sharp dynamic. So I was curious how does C plus plus compare to C sharp. <laughs> I had to say that C sharp was faster than C plus plus, and I put all the optimization on Windows. But then I took these three classes that I was able to run on Windows, and it was run on the on the virtual machine running on the same physical machine, and they were four times faster on Linux. So that's kind of just a rough idea. There's something. I really don't have a, a, a firm proof or anything. I can just tell you that, that these classes will perform much slower on Windows than they do on Linux for some reason. Something to do a little bit of research on why is that the case. And here's a overview of the features comparison. So if you look at any, you can assign all types to it doesn't provide really any operations on those types other than getting the same type out. Doesn't provide any conversions and the retrieval of the values externalized, not part of the class. Variant, you can assign, assign predefined types. Operations are external through visitors mainly. There's no built-in conversion and then the retrieval of the value is also with the external facilities. Type erasure, you can assign anything to it. Operations are sort of internalized, at least they appear such. Um, there is no built-in conversion. Retrieval is also e externalized. Dynamic has predefined types. Operations are built-in, they're internal. Conversion, just the predefined conversions. And then the retrieval, there's an interface of the class that gives facilities for retrieval of the value. Dynamic var will take any value, it has uh, internal operations. Conversion is basically the specializations of uh, conversions for types. So it's sort of built in. Uh, retrieval is pretty much automatic. There's, there are casts happening in there where you can assign things to each other as you've seen before. This was done by Schalk at the ACCU. It was kind of at a glance of the presentation. He put everything that I was talking about. Kind of weird, so put it here, share it with you. Now here's what Herb said. The biggest problem facing us is the lack of large set of the URL and the fact of standard libraries. And I do believe that that's, that's a, a, a problem for C++. And that will be my presentation. We have three minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, I know the spirit has a whole many where the storage model is similar to type erasure, but they have small object optimization. Does type erasure have that as well? Uh, the, the question is about the spirit facilities for type erasure. And I believe that Stephen is probably more qualified to answer that than myself. Yes. Uh, it is, it, 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 it is, it is to an extent, yes, yes.
Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, interested in what, the, what Steven has done. That's really interesting because what we have in like Poco Dynamic VAR is essentially just holding any value and conversion that are most common. But then how do you add custom operations on types and things like that? That's, that's very interesting to me. And uh, based on, on, on your, uh, so your, uh, your question was, do, do we uh, look, are, are we playing? I mean, uh, uh, the, the question is, should we, we be looking at the, at the self-describing messaging? Does that, I'm not really familiar with, with that uh, concept. So is that like changing the language or would it be a, would it be a library solution? I think of like if you put something into a JSON and send it across the wire, you know, it's sort of self describing But you may not want to pay the price. There's always this balance of, you know, if you want to be fully, you know, static and performant, then you will pay the price on the user interface because the user will have to worry about things like you mentioned, you know, with any. So it, it's always it's always like that. This Indeed, the, my, my work with, with, with POCO Dynamic VAR, yes, it is kind of taking into the direction of a dynamic language, but it's still, it's still static. I mean, C++ is a static language. You just use those holes into the type system that allow you to provide dynamic-like li behavior. And it really works nice in many circumstances. I have another presentation at 11 that actually shows that in the practical use, how can you transparently just get anything from the database and, and, and things like that, so we can take that conversation there if you're interested. I have to, I have to find out in which room I'm speaking. <laughs> it's kind of a challenge you have to find your way through the maze, but. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is another, there's a whole another 90 minute presentation that's talking about, pretty much it's about the POCO dynamic VAR and the use in a real world scenarios, like when you're querying the database, or if you want to take, say, uh, event-based insert or update in the database and reflect it on the web page without, you know, really having to do it. It just kind of goes, it's event-based. So that's, that's the next spe speech. We can, we can take it there and discuss it further. Yes. Does uh, Poco Dynamic VAR support JSON? Dynamic VAR supports JSON in a very, uh, it's a question, how, how much does Poco Dynamic VAR support JSON? Does, does it support the JSON arrays and objects, right? Is, is that where you're? To, uh, it will parse it. To, let me put it this way: the the JSON support within Poco Dynamic VAR is very rudimentary, but we have a JSON library, which uses Dynamic VAR extensively. So that's where we kind of put focus on JSON. So, yes. The, the question was, what would, what would it look like in terms of performance if the, the Java script interface was kind of wrapped into a similar functionality? With regards to POCO, what we're doing, I started the works a couple of years ago, but then it got stalled, and then there were some other contributors that have done some work. I started a work on a script library that will have a front end, and then you could have different scripting back ends. So that was the approach that I was deeming appropriate for addressing the, the, the interface toward the dynamic environments. Now, how would JavaScript API compared to this? I really don't have an answer, but it will be an interesting you know, topic for research. Yes. Yes, and, and double conversion is coming straight from V8 JavaScript engine. So they're using the same thing. That's pretty much what it is. You're, mostly what you're doing is you're going between numbers and strings. That, that's what you're doing the most. And, and that's what that thing does. And it does it pretty well. So. Any other questions? 
Well, thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed it.